less light. Wow, we're already at lecture 20. We've been having a lot of lectures, haven't we? But that's, that's intentional, so hopefully you'll have more time later in the semester uh, to devote to your projects. We'll ease on the lectures at that time and give you more time on your projects. How was the guest lecture on Monday? Was that interesting? No? <laughs> it was not interesting? <laughs> Hopefully that gave you a very different space of uh, computer architecture, parallel computer architecture than the IBM systems. I don't know how much detail there was. What do you guys think? No feedback? Was it useful to learn about ARM? No? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> it was useful for you? Yeah. Yeah? Not useful for some others? <laughs> yeah. That's a, did you ask hard questions? Yeah, it's interesting that ARM also has out of order execution. It's architectures right now, right? That's, it's, it's definitely not research what they do. Uh, but we'll cover some of the principles that led to out of order execution. Uh, hopefully, sometime next week when we cover data flow. But today, I want to wrap up some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, speculation in particular and interconnects. So I have a combo of speculation plus interconnects. It's kind of the third lecture for both of them. And I'll quiz you on interconnects too, so hopefully you'll give me some answers. But before that, <laughs> you were expecting this probably. Uh, I'd like you to review some more papers. One is on interconnects. Uh, a paper that I like for whatever reason. Uh, it's on basically exploiting slack and packet latencies in on-chip networks. Uh, this is a very recent paper that we did. It's in ISCA 2010. Uh, hopefully you'll like it. Uh, I think it's a nice, cute idea. And I think systems should be built more using a principle, the principle of slack. The idea is basically some packets have slack if you can predict the slack and determine the slack, slack means if you delay this packet for n cycles, you're not going to degrade performance, at least significantly. If you can figure that out, then you can prioritize. You can adapt your prioritization policy such that you minimize the slack in your system. Right? That way, you can achieve better energy efficiency and better performance also, because there are some packets that are more critical that have less slack than others. And you could apply this principle to other uh, parts of the system as well. So I think when you're reading this paper, think about applying this principle to other parts of the system. And we did apply it to the on-chip networks in this case, because that's um, like, why, why, why do some packets have more slack than the others? Think about an out-of-order processor, right? You, have, you can generate multiple misses, cache misses in parallel. Let's say one of them goes out all the way to memory. And the other one, that's a later one, uh, hits in the cache, hits in a cache bank that's a little bit farther. Obviously, the second one has a lot of slack, right? You don't have to service it right away. Whereas another more critical packet from another application may require the same paths in the network. Maybe you want to prioritize that over the second packet of this particular application. So how do you detect that, and how do you do the prioritization decisions? This may not be the best way of doing it, but the basic idea uh, is presented in the paper. There may be better ways of actually exploiting that basic idea. The second paper is, as you notice, I think this is ISCA 1 or 2. I have to think about that. Does anybody know? ISCA, I think it's ISCA 1. It's the first ISCA, uh, 1974. And this is the data flow paper. Uh, it's, it's relatively basic, but uh, this is one of those seminal papers that you guys should read in parallel computer architecture. So hopefully, hopefully this will be not uh, too difficult of a read except for the terminology part. 
you should be able to understand the concept relatively easily. Uh, the next paper, this is uh, one of the hardcore data flow papers. Basically, how do you actually design a data flow processor that uh, works with function calls and loops? This paper doesn't necessarily work with function calls and loops, and we'll co uh, come to that when we cover data flow. But this is how to make it work with function calls and loops. And this, uh, uh, I'll warn you uh, from now on, this is a hard to read paper. <laughs> but it's an important paper that you should be aware of, I think. Uh, that's why I'm not, gonna, I'm not taking it out of the review list. But it may be a painful read. <laughs> Just so that you're ready for it. <laughs> okay? So hopefully this should be fun. And hopefully I got the dates right. 28th, that's Sunday. And 30th is Tuesday, right? Okay? So we'll cover data flow next. Uh, and then we don't have a whole lot of topics to cover, actually. We'll cover GPUs. And, and if there are any topics that you would like me to lecture on, you would like to discuss, I'm open to that as well. So if there's something that you're really excited about, we can certainly go into that. Let me know through email. Or you can shout right now if you want. Anybody? <laughs> Think about it. OK. Uh, some more due in the future, perhaps. <laughs> this is not due yet, but you can uh, read some of this. this is, people have actually designed uh, real data flow computers at the time. And this is one of the uh, prototypes, the Manchester data flow computer. It's, uh, this is also a hard to read paper, uh, but it's good to be aware of. Uh, I'll, I'll cover the basic principles of the Manchester computer. Uh, it works similarly to uh, the MIT's tag token data flow architecture. But there is less detail in this paper. Mm. And uh, this is an unsuccessful, uh, these are the unsuccessful data flow. Uh, well, I should say unsuccessful, commercially unsuccessful data flow architectures. And I think we've discussed uh, why they were commercially unsuccessful briefly in 447, if you had taken 447. Basically, these are data flow architectures that expose data flow to the ISA level. Right? The ISA instruction set architecture is at the ISA level. Instruction set are, uh, instructions are data flow instructions. Basically, instructions specify which, uh, what are the destination instructions. And that's relatively hard to change. And uh, there are issues with that, right? One issue is debugging, for example. How do you debug such an architecture? Because you have massive parallelism, and it's not clear what your state is. It's not a sequential programming model anymore. You don't have a program counter, if you remember from 447. Do you guys remember? No program counter in data flow. We, 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 dis we discussed it briefly, especially in the first lectures, right? Even program counter is a choice in your instructions at architecture. You don't have to have a program counter. Program counter is an artifact of the ISA we have designed to ensure sequential execution, right? How do you ensure sequential execution? You have an instruction pointer. And you move to the next instruction. And then you move to the next instruction. And then you move to the next instruction. Inter inherently, that's not very parallel, right? You're executing one instruction at a time. That's the von Neumann architecture. Whereas data flow, you don't have a program counter. Instructions can appear in any order. And the only thing that constrains the processing, the fetch and execution of instructions is whether the data is available. Source, source operands of the instructions, uh, of an instruction are available. Once they're available, you can fetch the instruction, execute it, and make the data available for the destinations of that instruction. Now that's a fundamentally different programming and execution model. And if you expose this execution model to the programmer, now the programmer needs to reason about state. Right? How, do you, how do you reason about state? There is no clean abstraction. You don't know which instruction is done, which instruction is executing, because that's dependent on the latencies of the instructions, which are variable. Right. Yes? <laughs> So it, it could, 
except the question is, do you, uh, you're, you're, you're thinking, you're thinking, yeah, you're thinking this uh, model is ISA is still, ISA is still sequential, right? Mm -hmm. It could approximate the performance of a data flow model. That's right. Maybe without the fetch part, right? Maybe you need to do something with the fetch. Maybe you need to do out of order fetch also. Existing out of order engines do in order fetch. But you're right, you're thinking in the right direction. If you have a very large instruction window, now you have, you're looking at a bigger portion of the program. And the hope is that you're getting the benefits of data flow. And that's, the, that, that, that's what has been commercially successful, basically, a restricted data flow. And we'll, we'll get to this. But basic, the basic idea is you don't expose this data flow to the programmer. You keep the sequential programming model, but apply the data flow principles underneath. And keep the sequential programmer model to the very end, basically. Instructions are fetched in order and committed in order, but underneath, you execute the model order. So once you read the data flow papers, these papers will make a lot more sense. Uh, and these are the first papers that have proposed a way of applying data flow principles to a sequential programming model, a sequential ISA, or a von Neumann architecture, basically. OK. Well, I guess before that. <laughs> uh, but these are not due yet. We'll, we'll probably make them due sometime. <laughs> you all got my email, probably, right? Uh, we'll have uh, project milestone presentations uh, on Friday. And it'll be in class. And we'll try to get uh, to all of the groups. And we'll enforce timing. Otherwise, I don't think we're, we're going to be able to get to all of those groups. Uh, I hope there's no class after us. Or there's no, there's no one in this room after us. But the format will be like this, a nine minute presentation per group, uh, two minutes for question and answers, and one minute grace period for you <laughs> to use. I guess ideally we would use that one minute grace period to, uh, for the context switch overhead, which is <laughs> you sit down and somebody else comes, <laughs> comes up and presents. That's the switching overhead, right? <laughs> uh, what to present, this is basically uh, the same thing, hopefully you turned in. But uh, I'd like you to focus on, certainly motivate the problem so that everybody in the uh, class knows what you're working on. What is the, what is the problem? Uh, what is the solution idea that you're seeking in this project? Uh, and potential strengths and weaknesses. And uh, basically, what has your methodology been so far? And what are your concrete mechanisms? So focus on the concrete uh, mechanisms that you've implemented so far. And what are the current results that you have? Uh, because this is milestone one, uh, so hopefully all of you have re results. Uh, and what will you do next, basically? What hypotheses you have for the future? And I guess you don't have to comment on how close you were to your target. It'd be good to do that, but I'm, I'm most interested in uh, this part. But you'll have to motivate so that everybody in the class knows. So it's like a mini conference presentation, except it's nine minutes. OK? And, well, it's still not working. Interesting. This is in random order <laughs> of animation. <laughs> you can certainly update your slides that you turned in. In fact, please do so. Uh, present your latest results. And send them to me and Han by 2.30 PM on Friday. Uh, Han is the more important part here, I think, <laughs> because he'll gather all of them. And uh, we'll put them on a single laptop. And you, you already have the examples, right? How many of you have looked at them already? That's good. Well, hopefully, hopefully all of you, other than the ones who are sleeping. OK. Any questions on milestone presentations? So hopefully it'll be fun. You guys will learn, will learn a lot uh, about what everybody else is doing, plus get feedback on what you're doing. OK, so last few lectures, uh, we've covered a lot of different things. Uh, speculation in parallel machines, if you remember, we've covered that extensively. We had two lectures on that, and we'll have part of this lecture today. Uh, interconnection networks, 
Hopefully you learned a lot about that also. I guess we'll see. And we had the guest lecture from Arm talking about the cortex uh, architecture and their, their heterogeneous multi-core architecture also. Was, were you guys interested in that? Was there a lot of detail on the big little architecture as they call it? So uh, a lot of the cons, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, did, did they talk about specific policies as to when they switch between the cores? Um, a little bit. They talked about not not too much in the tech talk. Mostly um, that on the switch because they're the ISAs is the same for both of the A7 and A15. They literally can do the switch really quick because they just have to copy everything straight across. Mm -hmm. And that you can play some tricks with the coherency mechanisms for snooping that allows you to do it faster, some things that you don't have to go all the way to memory, you can just kind of catch it right across the coherent interface. That's right. Something like that. So it's very similar to what we've discussed, right? Accelerating critical sections. You have the same ISA on multiple cores and you can ship the critical sections to the large core. I don't know if they do that, but this is a substrate that's very amenable to doing that. I think perhaps that'll be their next step, right? It's, it's interesting that the arm is doing it and the reasons are energy efficiency, right? They, they would like the performance of the large core and they would like the energy efficiency of small cores. And you can have both of them at the same place. So my expectation is that most of the industry will go that way because it just makes sense, right? <laughs> uh, and I expect that uh, as they go forward with this architecture, they'll optimize the execution of parallel uh, programs uh, with some of the techniques that we talked about. Maybe not exactly that way, but the ideas will, uh, like some of the bottleneck identification and scheduling ideas will make, make, make their way into that sort of architecture. So it's good that they're, uh, they're implementing a single ISA heterogeneous multi-core. Okay, today I guess we'll cover transactional memory finally, <laughs> briefly. You read the paper about it, but I think it's still good to cover it in lecture. You guys remember it? Yes? <laughs> no? <laughs> and we'll uh, wrap up interconnects, hopefully. We'll see. Okay. Uh, this is just a review. Uh, we've been talking about speculation in many ways, but one use of speculation is to improve parallel program performance. Uh, and the goal has been to reduce the impact of serializing bottlenecks, right? Uh, you can improve performance, improve programming ease, actually improve energy efficiency also, but uh, and examples, this is a slide that you've seen before. Transactional memory paper you read, speculative lock collision that we talked about a lot, speculative synchronization, and transactional lock free execution. These are all similar concepts. Uh, transactional memory and speculative lock collision, the difference is do you expose these mechanisms to the programmer? Do you actually expo uh, expose a different interface to the programmer? In speculative lock collision, programmer programs with locks. Right? And the underlying hardware tries to execute those critical sections in parallel. And it works nicely if those critical sections don't have data conflicts, right? Multiple threads can execute the same critical section in parallel. In transactional memory, it's the underlying architecture is very similar. Underlying microarchitectural mechanisms would be very similar. Right? Except the programmer programs without the locks. And the hope is that programmer, programmer's life is easier also. And we'll get to that. So you, you remember speculative lock collision. Many locks are not necessary for multiple reasons that we've covered because you may not actually be updating data, for example. You may not be updating the same parts of the data structure. Uh, and the idea here was to speculatively assume that the lock is not necessary and execute the critical section without acquiring the lock. And then check if you've done the right thing at the very end. If there was a conflict, conflicting access to any of the data that you've accessed within the critical section, then you roll back. Right? And you can detect that conflict with the coherence protocol. Now we've talked about a very naive way of doing that. You can optimize that in many different ways. And this paper talks about a naive way of doing that. 
Yeah, how do you do that? Basically check for conflicts within the critical section and roll back if the assumption is incorrect. And this was an example, right? Programmers uh, are conservative. They can have a lock for the entire hash table, but then different threads may update different portions of the hash table. But these are serialized if you actually have a lock, right? So locking uh, serializes the access of different threads to the entire data structure. So you lose a lot of performance because of that. And speculative lock collision eliminates, elides those locks, parallelizing accesses to the same data structure that are not conflicting. Transactional memory does the same thing, except the programmer's life is even easier in this case. Programmer doesn't even need to put locks. The programmer specifies the code that is to be executed atomically and encapsulates them as transactions. The programmer says, begin transaction, end transaction, and the understanding is that that code executes atomically. Does that make sense? It, either all of that code is executed or none of that code is executed. The, and the hardware or the software guarantees this, system guarantees this execution. Uh, this is mainly motivated by the difficulty of lock-based programming and also motivated uh, by the lack of concurrency or performance issues in blocking synchronization, which is really lock-based programming. If you think about locks, uh, what you're doing is you're blocking another thread until uh, uh, the thread that's holding the lock gets out of the critical section, right? That's called blocking synchronization. But an alternative is non-blocking synchronization, which what transactional memory is. This is also called, blocking synchronization is also called pessimistic concurrency. You're pessimistic in the sense that uh, you're allowing only one thread to execute the critical section, even though there may be no conflicts in the critical section. As opposed to optimistic concurrency, you'll, you'll hear these terms, which is what transactional memory is like. You're optimistic in the sense that you're gonna assume that uh, the different threads will not update the same data, will not conflict. That's optimistic concurrency. Okay, are you guys familiar with these terms? These are good terms to know. I don't think the uh, Hurley and Moss paper discusses all of these terms. Maybe it sprinkles them somewhere, but uh, it's good to know. Pessimistic concurrency, locks, optimistic concurrency, transactions. And speculative lock collision is pessimistic concurrency at the programming level, but optimistic concurrency at the hardware level. Right. Okay. So there are issues with locks. It's good to think about some of these issues, I think. Uh, basically, objects, uh, lock, a lock is an object that's, you can think about as an object uh, that can be held by only one thread at a time, right? You can lock, a, a, for, uh, you can associate a lock with each shared data structure, right? That's what many programming models do, uh, do like Java, when you do a synchronized object. It associates a lock with that object, right? Uh, how do you use it? Basically, a thread blocks for a while until it acquires the lock. Once it acquires the lock, it can access the object, and it releases the lock once it's done with the critical section, with that function, synchronized function called in Java, for example. So there, uh, this leads to correctness issues, which is you can underlock, right? If you, if you do not figure out uh, what uh, part of your program should be executed, uh, should be subject to mutual exclusion, then you can get wrong results, right? And this is a common problem actually in locks. For example, a programmer may forget a lock. He may access a data structure that's really supposed to be shared, but you don't put a lock around it. That's, a, that's one of the bugs uh, that happen in multi-threaded programs. Uh, or if you have a complicated data structure, if you have multiple locks, if you need to acquire multiple different data structures, for example, and update all of them in a mutually exclusive way, now you have an issue uh, with ordering of the locks. One thread may acquire locks in one order, another thread may acquire the locks in another order, and the threads may be waiting for each other. In that case, you can have deadlock, right? You assume 
anybody who has taken OS courses <laughs> probably has run into those issues. How many, how many of you guys have taken OS courses? That's it? Nobody around here? <laughs> no, no 410? That's, that's not required? That's a good course. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'd encourage you guys to take to OS courses, actually, operating system courses, and actually implement some of these things. Uh, because then you will understand the issues really well uh, in locking especially the system calls that implement this locking, if you can uh, do those, or the libraries, you'll figure out the deadlocks. I debugged a lot of deadlocks. <laughs> and it's not fun. <laughs> Actually, it's fun once you figure out the problem. <laughs> but once you, by the time you figure out the problem, you spend a lot of time uh, for that. And it's not, in the end, it's not fun if you're really writing a big software uh, program. And many, many software programs have these issues, actually. So this is, uh, when you write a multi-thread program, you do run into these issues. Both issues. And oh, it's good to see that by experience. That's why I'm suggesting that you guys take uh, OS or parallel programming courses also. So these are correctness issues. Obviously, your program can become wrong if you don't put the place the locks in the right place. Uh, you can solve the correctness issues by trading off performance. Right. Uh, one thing you could do is underlocking is easily solved by having a big lock, right? A single lock for the entire program, <laughs> for the entire thread execution. But obviously, that's not useful for parallelism. So you're trading off a lot of performance. Uh, again, acquires in different orders that can be sold again with a single lock, right? By trading off performance. There's a, there's a big trade-off between performance and correctness in multi-thread programs. You can increase serialization, which makes your program more likely correct, but then that reduces your performance. Why does it reduce your performance? Because if you increase the size of your critical section by having a lock that protects a bigger critical section, because you have conservative serialization with locking, only one thread can execute the critical section, you're serializing many threads. And the likelihood of serialization increases as the critical section size increases. Because with a small critical section, maybe you have no contention on the lock. But if you increase the critical section size to avoid these correctness issues, then you'll have more contention, because more threads will likely reach that point in the program. Right. Uh, there's also other performance issues related to locks. Overhead of acquiring the locks, right? Acquiring and releasing the locks. These, these are uh, actual updates to shared data. And ping-ponging, we've discussed. Ping-ponging happens with locks. Uh, it's difficult, basically, because of these, it's difficult to find the right granularity. Uh, and blocking is another overhead, basically. That's, again, serialization. I guess these two things are uh, talking about these. Mm. OK, I think this is clear, right? Uh, so transactions can actually solve a lot of these problems. Uh, well, one other thing you can think of is speculative lock collision. Keep that in the back of your minds. You could program with locks. You could be uh, conservative, but the underlying hardware can reduce that. But let's, uh, let's get to that. Transactions can solve some of these issues. So underlocking, uh, sometimes underlocking happens because the programmer cannot reason about what to protect. Or programmer can be forgetful. Uh, whereas if you have transactions, you have a simpler interface to the programmer. Programmer doesn't need to deal with individual locks. Right? Programmer just says, begin transaction and end transaction. And something, somehow, magically, mutual exclusion is satisfied. And you know what that magic is, right? The underlying hardware does something like speculative lock collision. Does that make sense? or transactional memory, as you read in the paper. So this simpler interface reduces the underlocking, or that's the hope. Uh, deadlocks due to lock ordering, well, with transactions, the programmer, again, doesn't need to reason about ordering of locks. Right? Again, it's begin transaction and transaction. 
somebody else's problem. Deadlock is somebody else's problem. Who is that somebody else? Well, if you're doing this in the underlying software, that software writer who guarantees atomicity using transactions, that's their problem. They should ensure that the, the transactional memory system should not deadlock. If it's done in hardware, again, the hardware should ensure that the transactional memory system should not deadlock. Right? Uh, locks are blocking, as we've discussed. Transactions are non-blocking. Right? That's, that's a fundamental uh, difference. So this is the uh, slowness. And I think this is, uh, these are going into the same thing, basically. Uh, because, because you're blocking your serials, uh, you, you get conservative serialization. Right? You serialize uh, on the same lock. But with transactions, transactions are non-blocking, meaning that you don't wait for uh, entering a critical section. You just enter a critical section. You abort only if there's a data conflict right, between two threads or between two transactions. And serialization, as a result, happens only on a data conflict. Right? Serialization doesn't happen conservatively. It happens after the fact. Now you could be more intelligent, of course. You could predict whether, you will, uh, whether a transaction will conflict with another. And then the underlying system, if it does this kind of prediction, it can say, oh, I'm not going to be very optimistic about this. I'm going to stall this thread until this other thread gets out of the transaction, assuming those conflicts happen. So you could actually optimize the underlying system. And that's easier to do with if someone else implements the transactions, right? This is harder to do if you're the programmer reasoning about these things. Make sense? OK, we already talked about this. So transactional memory uh, uh, allows all of these because it allows the arbitrary multiple memory locations to be updated atomically. Right? That's really the underlying mechanism. You can atomically update multiple memory locations arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary memory locations. What are the basic mechanisms? Uh, well, it's the same thing really as uh, speculative lock collision, the underlying mechanisms. Uh, you have transactions executing on different threads. You need to somehow isolate them. Right? You need to ensure that, uh, and you need to figure out conflicts between those threads. You need to, uh, I guess you can, arbitrary pieces of your code can be encapsulated with, I guess, begin transaction and then end transaction. And then some other thread could be also executing in the middle of another transaction. And somehow these two transactions should appear isolated to each other. Right? And somehow, the underlying system needs to detect the conflicts. If this transaction does a store to x, and if this transaction is loading from x, that's a conflict. Only one of them should uh, execute, right? Make sense? Which means that this, these, the execution of these two transactions need to be serialized if this happens. And how does it happen? Well, you could do the same thing as the speculative lock collision mechanism we discussed, right? When this transaction is executing, basically this will appear as a read exclusive request. And this transaction, when it's executing, it, let's say it did a load. It can mark its cache line. You can have a read bit and a write bit in your cache block. And when this does a load, its read bit is set, right? And then this transaction does a store. In the coherence protocol, we'll send a read exclusive request to the cache block of this transaction. I'm assuming this load happened before the store. And when this transaction gets the read exclusive request, maybe it can abort. Right. This may not be the best mechanism, as we discussed. But that's, that's one way of ensuring that, right, the underlying hardware. Make sense? So somehow you need to detect when a conflict occurs. And this is one way of detecting it, the underlying hardware, using the underlying hardware and the coherence protocol. And also you need to have a, a way of managing uh, these new and old values, right? 
Remember, this transaction needs to execute atomically, which means that you need to have a way of rolling back the transaction, going back to the beginning of this, because you're speculatively executing the transaction. Uh, there are two things. You should be able to roll back, which, which is usually accomplished with a checkpoint. You take a register checkpoint at the beginning. But what happens with the new values that you produce with the store? Since you're executing this atomically, either all or none, this new value should be buffered somewhere, right? So this needs to be buffered. Again, similar to speculative lock collision, where do you buffer these values? You could put them in the cache, right? Or similar to thread level speculation. You cannot commit a thread until you know that it's non-speculative. So the same issues appear here again. You somehow need to record the new values and ensure atomicity. If this transaction is supposed to execute, then you make these values visible to all other uh, parts of the system. Now, even that's a design choice, right? You could be very eager about it. You could make these values visible early on, but then you'll need to clean up the mess, right? Then you need to ensure that the programmer uh, uh, still sees the, uh, still, uh, the, the, the semantics of the programming language is still obeyed, okay? So basically, atomicity, at the end of the transaction, you can either commit the new values that are produced or abort back to the old values, meaning go back to the beginning of the transaction. So all of the, how, to, how to do these, there are a lot of de design choices which I will not get into. Like you could, you could detect the conflicts right away, right, and abort the transaction that receives a read exclusive request. But that's not the best choice, really, because does that guarantee forward progress, I guess? What if there are a lot of transactions that are doing these stores and this poor transaction is always getting read exclusive requests? Right. So there are issues related to forward progress here, and that may not be the best option. Maybe there's a better option. Basically, record the, uh, what is called the read set and the write set of each transaction, and Potentially, at the end of the transaction, make a decision, right? Which transaction should commit? Now you can be fair about it. But then there's another issue related to this. How do you make sure that this is a scalable solution, right? Who, who does this? Do you arbitrate across all the transactions in the system? So I'd encourage you to think about these issues. The paper you read is a very basic paper. It doesn't cover all of these issues. Mm. Okay, but the, the takeaway is issues are the same as other speculative parallelization schemes. You need to do logging, buffering, you need to do conflict detection, you need to do abort and rollback, and you need to support commits of multiple cache blocks at the same time. And these, these are the issues that we've discussed, right? Uh, these are the four issues with, in speculative parallelization. I renamed this to transactional memory here. How to deal with unavailable values? Well, in this case, unavailable values uh, don't exist, right? Unavailable values existed uh, in the case where you did speculative thread level speculation. Right? You uh, think about multiscalar, right? Multiscalar parallelize the program on multiple processors, and a register value may not be available. Here, the program is already parallel, right? You don't have that problem of unavailable values. Now, you may uh, have a conflict. You could think of a conflict as an unavailable value. And you could potentially predict that, but that's another issue. How do you deal with speculative up updates? Uh, one, uh, one th uh, wh where do you buffer them? You could be very optimistic about this, as I said. You, could, you need to clean up your mess if you actually update the value and other transactions actually see it. Uh, and that's tough to deal with. That's a very complex transactional memory system if you actually update. Normally, it's easier to buffer the value and update, uh, make it visible to other transactions only, at the, only after you know that the transaction is supposed to commit, meaning there are no data conflicts in this transaction. It's a lot easier. This is a, an analogy is in an out-of-order execution processor, do you retire or commit instructions out of order? 
if you commit instructions out of order, you have to clean up the mess again if, if there's an exception that happens later on uh, at the previous instruction. How do you detect the conflicts? Uh, this is what we've discussed. Do you detect them eagerly? Uh, meaning, uh, so one way of detecting them is actually at every coherence protocol message, you flag a conflict. Another way, you don't uh, flag a conflict that way, but you, you keep track of the read set and write set. And this actually, you don't necessarily need a co coherence protocol support with this. You basically, with each transaction, you record the cache blocks you've read and written to. And at the end of a transaction, you compare this read set and write set to all of the other transactions that are executing in the system. Right. You don't necessarily need coherence protocol support for this. And that's, that's a lazy way of doing it. Whereas eager way of doing the uh, conflicts is whenever somebody writes to a location, like the store x, uh, anybody else who read that location flags a conflict, potentially through the coherence protocol. And these are different ways. The hardware implications are also different. Right. In fact, a lot of the software transactional memory implementations do this read set and write set kind of implementation. Basically, in software, you record in a filter, in a software filter, what, what addresses are being read. And at the end of the transaction, the software checks. If you don't have any, think about having no hardware support for atomicity. You could do all of these things in software. And people have done software transactional, implemented software transactional memory uh, systems. So I'd encourage you to think about that also. It's, it's hard to go into all the detail uh, in all of these things. OK, and how and when to abort rollback or commit? We've discussed this also. If you're detecting conflicts eagerly, do you abort right away? Well, I guess you know how to, uh, when, when to commit. <laughs> if your transaction is uh, executed without any conflicts, then you should be able to commit. But how to commit is also important because you need to ensure that all of those locations are updated at the same time, right, atomically. You don't want an inconsistent state to be seen by some other transaction or some other part of the system. Okay. So there are many uh, variations of transactional memory. I'll not go into detail on any of them, I think. Software has high performance overhead because you could think of this as an underlying layer that basically guarantees everything that we've discussed. And that underlying layer can be all software. Basically, very high performance implementations of locks guarantee this. How do you do that? You can read the software transactional memory paper. It's called software transactional memory. <laughs> you can search for it. And that's a good paper also. I think it was POTC 1995. Is that right? Somebody can search for it and let me know. Han, you can put it online. Mm. Unless you guys want to review it. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> OK. Uh, there's also pure, uh, so software implementations have the advantage that uh, there are no issues with virtualization. Right? Let's say you have, uh, you get a context switch in the middle of a transaction. What do you do? Hardware has an issue with that, right? If, if it's purely hardware, now you're keeping track of uh, all of the read sets and write sets in hardware. And you need to switch out this transaction out of the system or thread that's executing this transaction out of the hardware. But it's in the middle of a transaction. What do you do? I guess you could abort that transaction and switch the thread out. But that may not be the best thing to do. If you don't abort the transaction and switch the thread out, now you need to be able to detect conflicts with that transaction, right? But now the transaction is not in hardware anymore. So what do you do? That's, that becomes tough. People have proposed a lot of solutions, but you need software support. That's why pure hardware transactional memory is very tough, because it ignores all of the software layers, right? It doesn't interact with the system very well. 
the transactional memory implementation should work with a context switch, right? Or work gracefully, at least, with a context switch. You cannot just abort a transaction when you get a context switch. Because what if the transaction is long? Uh, well, another option to handle this is uh, basically to guarantee the execution of transactions. Tell the programmer, your transactions cannot be more than x instructions. It cannot touch more than x cache blocks. And if you do that, then you can have hardware support that guarantees the execution of such transactions. Right. What is the downside of that? Yeah. Exactly. You lose a lot of the benefits that we've discussed, right? The, the whole motivation of transactional memory was to make programmers' life easier and get high performance at the same time. Before, with locks, the programmer didn't even need to worry about how big the critical section should be, how many cache blocks it should touch. Now, if you're making the programmer worry about those, you're actually built, is, uh, giving the programmer a much harder to reason about interface. Right. So yeah, with the hardware, you get those issues. Uh, what if buffering is not enough? How do you handle, how do you handle I.O. within transactions? Uh, basically, you need some support for virtualization. So usually, hybrid hardware software mechanisms are the best uh, in transactional memory. Mm. Uh, so if you have large transactions, perhaps one option is to have the hardware handle the small transactions. And when the transaction becomes too big, for example, if you have too many, uh, well, one, one, thing, one other thing the hardware needs to worry about is, let's say you're keeping all these read-write bits you're keeping track of these read-write bits per cache block. What if that cache block gets evicted from your cache? Do you keep track of read-write bits in me main memory? That's a lot of overhead, right? Two bits for, per each cache block in main memory, that's a lot of cost. So how do you do that? Uh, well, maybe you switch to software to handle this transa these transactions gracefully uh, if the transaction overflows some of these buffers in hardware. But then how do you do that? That's another uh, question. And there have been papers on this. You can search for them. There have been actually many, many papers on this. <laughs> uh, but if you're interested, let me know. That's... OK, any questions? This slide probably covers 100 papers or so. <laughs> and the problem is, uh, it's still not known what's the best way to handle uh, transactional memory. I'll give you some references to existing uh, processors. And existing processors that have hard, uh, transactional memory have usually been best effort, meaning the programmer, uh, there are no guarantees. Or if there are guarantees, then the programmer needs to worry about how big of a transaction they uh, write. OK. So I'll give you a little bit of history also. Well, you read the uh, biggest history, but uh, uh, basically this paper was the first one to actually propose transactional memory. But some of the ideas uh, are uh, really inspired by log link store conditional operations. Are you guys familiar with this? Like how to, how to do lock-free atomic updates of a single cache block. That's where people uh, started. This enables you to do a lock-free atomic update of a single cache line. Uh, basically, how do you do that? Well, it's in many, many ISAs. Load linked returns the current value of a location. And you just store conditional subsequently to the same memory location. And the store is conditional in the sense that it stores a new value only if no updates have occurred to the location, if the value has not changed. Why would the value change? If some other processor updates the same location, the value would change. Right. So this way, you can figure out if some other processor actually updated that location. Right. And then you can abort uh, this thread. So store conditional fails if some other processor updated that same location. Make sense? You could do this with a single cache block, but how do you do this with multiple cache blocks? Well, this is, that's what 
transactional memory as proposed by Hurley and Mostas. Instructions explicitly identify transaction loads and stores, and there's a dedicated transaction cache that keeps track of these speculative updates. Hopefully this is sounding familiar now. Yes? I think I know you read this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the size of transactions is limited to the transaction cache, and that's the downside of it. And if you remember from the paper, uh, this is from the paper, our transactions are intended to replace short critical sections, right? No, not long critical sections. None of those issues that we've discussed, how to do context switches, I.O., is not there yet. For example, a lock-free data structure would typically be implemented in the following stylized way. Instead of acquiring a lock, executing the critical section, and releasing the lock, a process would use load transactional to read from a set of locations. So you do load transactional to read from different cache blocks. And use validate to check that the values read are consistent. At the end of the transaction, you do validate. Uh, and use uh, store to modify a set of locations. And use commit to make the changes permanent. If either the validate or the commit fails, the process returns to step one. And the, the transactional cache that's proposed in that paper and the operation is described, I will not go into detail, but it's essentially uh, provides you the mechanisms to detect conflicts, right? That transaction cache. And also buffer updates. Okay, any questions? I'm going through this very quickly because you've already read the paper. And hopefully you don't have a whole lot of questions about the paper. Okay. So if you want to see actually there some real implementations uh, today, uh, there are more processors that are implementing transactional memory. And there are some uh, good papers to look at. Sunrock was one of the uh, first processors. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. I guess it never existed. But, <laughs> but uh, this paper in ASPLOS 2009 uh, talks about some of the issues uh, that they have encountered with Sunrock's transactional memory implementation. Actually, I forgot one of the papers here, but that's okay. AMD's implementation of transactional memory. IBM BlueGene, this is a recent paper. Uh, it also has hardware support for transactional memory. Tra the programmer needs to worry about transactions, so it's not that simple. IBM System Z, you've already heard about it, at least uh, in a slide uh, when Brian Prasky presented it. Uh, you can have best effort transactions, now a programmer is responsible for aborts, right? It's similar to this. Programmer somehow needs to validate, insert these validate instructions. Not exactly the same, but the programmer worries about these things. But there are also guaranteed transactions, which is basically the, pro the programmer doesn't need to worry about it as long as the transactions satisfy some conditions. And you remember the conditions? I think uh, Brian said maybe 32 instructions, is that correct? Maybe I remember incorrectly. I'm sure you can read these in System Z manuals. But yeah, programmer needs to guarantee those conditions. And after that, they don't need to worry about uh, validate or abort. And you could argue that this is, is as limited usefulness as, we, as we've discussed. And Intel has well as an implementation of speculative lock collision. Again, the programmer needs to ensure some specific uh, requirements for this to be successful. Uh, well, for, for, for it to be transactional. Okay. There are many research issues. I think uh, some, of, uh, some of the biggest issues are how do you virtualize these transactions? How do you ensure that the programmer doesn't need to worry about the size of the transactions, yet also support system uh, uh, like handling of exceptions, for example, page faults within a transaction, or handling of I.O. operations within a transaction, handling of context switches within a transaction. All of these operations that you really would like uh, so, so that the programmer doesn't need to worry about. Or handling of even long transactions, right? Uh, in the presence of all of these issues, in the presence of buffer overflows in hardware. Buffer overflows meaning you have limited buffering in hardware to buffer uh, updates. And this is, uh, as far as I know from the literature, this is, a, this is an unsolved problem in an elegant way. So solutions exist, but they come with very high complexity. 
either in hardware or software. Handling I.O. within transactions, there's no problem with locks, right? You can, <laughs> you can block for a long time for I.O. Whereas with transactions, there's a problem. Uh, how do you do nested transactions? Uh, it's interesting, but I will not go into that. If you're interested in that, you can read some papers. And I guess one uh, question that has not been resolved is does transactional memory actually increase programmer productivity? And it's not clear what the answer is because if you actually limit uh, the benefits of transactional memory to very small transactions, then the programmer needs to reason about uh, how, to, how to reason about the size of the transactions. And maybe that actually makes programmers' life harder. <laughs> but maybe some programmers could benefit. Uh, potentially, like programmers who are programming kernels, OS kernels, deal with locks a lot. And they usually know uh, what size of transactions they need. And maybe those specialized set of programmers have an easier life in the sense that they can use transactions because they know what their transactions look like. Uh, and they can get higher performance out of their OS kernel. For example, in operating system, you have a lot of resource management operations, right? You have shared, uh, the operating system keeps track of whether or not a resource is available. And you have updates to those shared data structures that keep track of the availability of the resources. And that's why operating systems do a lot of locking. And if you eliminate locking in those uh, resource managers, you can improve the performance of an operating system significantly. And maybe in those cases where you have programmers that have intimate knowledge of the software and they can optimize it well, uh, but they want to get rid of locks because you can have parallel updates that way to those resource managers, uh, maybe you can get a uh, benefit and improve programmer productivity, but that's very specialized. Okay. Any questions? Yes? Are there any other use cases of transactional memory apart from getting rid of blocks? Mm, what, what, what kind of use case are you thinking of? Uh, like, maybe compiler could do more aggressive optimization in terms of loads and stores within the same transaction, uh -huh. and the hardware at the same time can figure out that this transaction did something bad because compiler's mistake, it can go back and uh -huh. run the optimized version. Like yeah, potentially, potentially the compiler, uh, this, this could enable the compiler to speculatively parallelize a program. So there could be potential uses. In a sense, the hard, uh, now, now you're exposing the hardware support for speculation to the compiler. So I think a lot of, uh, you can enable speculative parallelization that, in an easier way, potentially. Okay. I think let's take a break for five minutes and then talk about interconnect a little bit more. This is just to wrap up interconnect, although this may overflow to uh, the next lecture also. But hopefully you guys have all the basics for interconnect now. Did you guys enjoy the lectures? You learned a lot about the basics. Now it's time to answer some questions then. <laughs> if your answer to that was yes. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you've learned a lot of things. Uh, topology, buffering and flow control, routing, router design, network performance metrics, on-chip versus off-chip differences, and a string of work on energy efficient interconnects, in particular bufferless routing and minimally buffered routing. These all sound familiar, right? That's, and there's more need for energy efficient interconnects, actually. There's, there's an exciting research area that uh, many, many systems need interconnect. Uh, so there are three major parts of computers, like a computing system. Computation, communication, and storage. And all of these need to be efficient if you actually need to design a scalable system. And communication is one of the hardest things to get efficient. Uh, computational units, we're very good at making them efficient. People have optimized those for a long time. And memories also, right? We can uh, optimize memories to be very efficient. But communication, if you really need to move data from one place to another, that consumes a lot of power today. So you'd like to ideally minimize that communication 
And when you need to communicate, you would like to minimize the energy expended on that communication. And this goes against uh, the scalability of a system, right? Once you scale the system, you need a scalable interconnect. And you partition the problem. You either minimize the communication between the partition parts, different partitions, or you have a very good way of communicating efficiently. Right? And as we keep building systems that are more and more scalable, more and more cores, in other words, you need to have mechanisms to make this communication very efficient. There's no other way. Right? Either you cut the communication, there's no communication, or you make it efficient. But communication has to be there somehow if you're accessing data. Right? You minimize it, and when you need to do it, you make it efficient. That's why I think the research that you heard earlier in, with Chris and uh, I guess Kevin talked about his work, right? Uh, uh, that's very important to carry forward. But now I'll, I'll ask you some questions. <laughs> that's the first question. And I guess the person who answers it will win a prize. <laughs> what are the possible ways of handling contention in a router? You have two packets contending to go to the same output port. There you go. Well, one, one, one taker for the prize. <laughs> I guess the prize actually made you. <laughs> yes? Um, you could buffer the input packets to the router. OK. OK. You got two out of three. <laughs> yeah, you were the first one who raised their head. OK, that's right. Drop the packet, basically. That's right. Anything else? Who wants, who's going to come up with the fourth one? <laughs> OK, that's a good one. <laughs> Although that, does, that evades the question, right? That doesn't, <laughs> that's not an answer to the, this particular question, but that's more uh, somehow eliminating the question. <laughs> But that's right. I mean, that's not the answer to this question, though. Yeah, there are three fundamental ways. You either buffer the packets or you drop the packets. Actually, most people come up with these two answers. But since you've <laughs> been through uh, my classes, there's a third option, which is really deflecting the packet, misrouting the packet. And these are very fundamental. And in fact, deflecting the packet was proposed very early on also. I don't know if uh, Chris mentioned the paper that actually propose it, but this is Paul Baran's work on distributed communications networks in 1962, right? That was one of the solutions that was proposed for the internet early on. When you do routing, basically misroute packets. Deflect the packets uh, if, if you do not have enough buffering. And if your load is low, this is a good idea. So I guess who wins the prize right now? <laughs> You get two thirds of the prize, and you get one third. <laughs> okay, remind me of that. Han can take. Han can remind me. Okay, that's one. Another question. This is easier, probably. What is head of line blocking? There's a lot of terminology in interconnection networks, and this is one of them. Who has their hands up? Who wants to win another prize? No, nobody's sure. Yes. Does it have to do with if you break the packet up into like splits, that the head of the line is like the head packet, and then if that one gets blocked, everything kind of gets blocked behind it. Maybe. No. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sad to that. It's it's that I guess when one one packet gets blocked, all subsequent block of packets are, are basically stalled in, in in their in their nodes behind. That's yeah. That's kind of like that. It's not exactly, but okay. it's actually simpler that Bo both of the things you suggest. So if you think about a router, and this is relatively specific terminology, routers uh, you have these FIFO queues, right? channels, uh, and this is your router, and you have these outputs. Let's say north, south, east, west. Because these queues are FIFO, let's say you have a packet here. 
and you have another packet here. We don't need to go into flits. And this wants to go north, and this wants to go north. And let's say these are coming from different directions, right? Let's say, I guess, north, south, east, west, or something like that. It doesn't matter. They don't even need to be directions. Because these are FIFO, what might happen is you can have a packet here that wants to go north, another packet here that wants to go north, and only one of them can go north, which means that one of them will be blocked. Let's say this one's blocked. And if there's another packet that can go east here, even though there may be no other packet that wants to go east, it cannot go, right? Because the head of line <laughs> is blocked. The head of the FIFO cannot go. That's what this means, basically. Because, and the fundamental problem is you have FIFO queues, and you arbitrate among the head, heads of the queues. Does that make sense? Heads of the input buffers. Now, you could solve this problem by taking into account all of the packets, right? But then that makes the router very complex. Like you could do out of order scheduling from, a five, uh, from this queue. But that makes the router complex, right? Here it's easy to arbitrate between one, two, three, four packets. It becomes a lot harder to arbitrate between eight packets here, more harder between, I guess, 12 packets, even harder if you want to do full out of order scheduling. Right? Like another option is to actually have a single buffer, right? And do out of order scheduling out of that buffer. Make sense? That's head of line blocking. Okay, that's an easy one also. What is a non minimal routing algorithm? Anybody? You guys know this, right? Well, I'll give a bigger prize that if that's a motivation. <laughs> and Han can record this. You have witnesses also. <laughs> yes? Doesn't always take the most direct route or the shortest path between two points? That's right. Yeah, it does, uh, and non, uh, an algorithm is non minimal if it doesn't take the shortest path to reach the destination. Simple. What about this? What is the difference between deterministic, oblivious, and uh, adaptive routing algorithms? And these are all different. It's related to what paths you take to reach your destination. Right? From you know, source and destination, minimal versus not minimal. OK, oh, we have Brian. So is deterministic is like based on the uh, the final destination. It, the router will always send it in the same direction. Um, and oblivious, like it doesn't know anything about like the source, like before it got to that router. Maybe. So you got the deterministic, right? Basically, okay. given a source and destination, you always take the same path to go from this source to the destination, which means that each individual router, knowing the destination, sends it to the, to the same direction. Oblivious, I'm not sure if I understood what you said. Yeah. Is, is oblivious routing just a, a routing algorithm that doesn't know the actual end uh, uh, the, the means to the actual end and it just sends it to its neighbors? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I think adaptive means it tries to, there, there's some intel it's not deterministic plus there's some intelligence in the routing algorithm to try and avoid uh, congestion, oblivious is just non deterministic and non adaptive. Okay, adaptive means, yeah, it tries to avoid congestion. It adapts to the network conditions. It may be congestion, it may be something else, you're right. And so say the oblivious again? Oblivious means, oblivious is the, all the remaining stuff. So non-deterministic, meaning it can take multiple routes, but mm -hmm. non-adaptive in the sense that it doesn't 
find out the routing of it. That's right, yes. Oblivious is actually oblivious of network conditions. Meaning, yes, you're non-deterministic. You can take a different path between the same source and the destination. But you do that in a manner that's oblivious of the network conditions. Meaning, you're no, you don't take into account the network conditions. And what's an example of that? You've seen this example, right? There's a very famous example from a Turing Award winner. In fact, it's called uh, that, the name of that Turing Award winner. <laughs> that person's algorithm. Is that enough hint? No? You guys didn't cover this in the lectures? Or maybe you're sleeping <laughs> during the lectures? It's a valence algorithm. No? Well, I, I guess I'll teach you something. <laughs> it's called valence algorithm. It's a randomized algorithm to balance the network load. But the goal is to balance the network load. So when you're sending a packet from a source to the destination, you first randomly pick a quadrant of the network and send it there. And that, from that quadrant of the network, you send it to the destination. And if you randomly pick the quadrant, then you, your goal is to balance the load across the entire network. It's non-minimal. Well, yeah, it is obviously not minimal. It's not deterministic, obviously, because you don't always take the same path. You take different paths based on the coin flip that you do. And it's oblivious of the network conditions. You don't care if there's congestion in one place or not. Your goal is to spread all of the requests across the network. Does that make sense? That's valence algorithm. Did you guys cover this? No? Yes, Han says yes, so <laughs> I believe Han. <laughs> All right, maybe you should study that. <laughs> because in the exam, I might ask you what's valence algorithm, right? <laughs> this is the kind of the oral exam question that could happen. <laughs> I guess what's an example of deterministic then? You guys should know this one. Yes? XY routing. XY routing. What does that mean? That's right. When you're going from a source to a destination, first take the x direction. And then once you reach the y point, go around along the y direction. Of course, this works in a two-dimensional network. If you have a three-dimensional network, maybe you have x, y, z routing, right? That's <laughs> OK. Now we're going to get progressively harder, maybe. So what routing algorithms need to worry about deadlock? So what is that lock? Yes? Doesn't that lock just occur wherever you have a potential loop? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right, yeah, when, you, when you have a circular dependency on a resource. So what routing algorithms need to worry about that? Yes? This is the wormhole where you have everything in a circle and have a head amount of blocking yeah, when you have a circular dependency, yeah. the algorithms that lead to circular dependencies need to worry about this. I guess that's a cop-out answer. <laughs> that's using the definition, but that's, that's actually correct. Whenever you have a circular dependency uh, in your routing algorithm, and we'll get to that, uh, you need to worry about deadlock. Actually, deadlock happens in multiple levels, right? It could be uh, deadlock when you're routing a particular packet, you could run into deadlock because multiple, uh, some other packet is holding the resource that you want. And you're holding the resource that other packet wants in a circular way. With two packets, it cannot happen. But with, if you have enough packets, and if they're going circularly, it can happen. Uh, that happens at the packet level. But it could also happen pr at the protocol level, right? You could have a request. And you, you could have a reply, but the injection of the replies may be blocked because you may have requests blocking the network. Then now you have a deadlock at the protocol level, right? That's another thing that needs to be solved. 
you could think of requests and replies being circularly dependent on each other. They're holding resources uh, they need. But we'll get to that. This is, this is an important topic, actually. And you've seen how, uh, how deadlock happens in a bufferless network. That could be another question. What routing algorithm need to worry about live lock? So deadlock is no progress, right? Live lock is packets make progress, but they never reach their destination. Here, the answer is simpler, I think. Yes? Like in a bufferless example, you deflect packets, right? And if you keep deflecting them, they'll keep moving around, but they may never get there. That's right. More generally? Uh, you, you had something. Um, any routing algorithm where uh, uh, flip is not guaranteed to make progress when it proceeds. That's right. <laughs> You're saying there, there's a term here that appears <laughs> somewhere. You're um, saying that basically. <laughs> so uh, oblivious or possibly adapted depending on the routing algorithm. Yeah. So basically, you're saying non-minimal. I think any non-minimal one really. Uh, if you have a minimal routing algorithm, then you should not really have issues with live lock. Because right? you're always taking the shortest path. Non-minimal means that you're not making progress necessarily. <laughs> Maybe you'll come up with a counterexample. That's good. I hope you do. <laughs> OK. <laughs> if you come up with it, let me know. How to handle deadlock? I guess this is not a question, but it's something for you to think about because there are many. Well, I guess, yeah, how do you handle deadlock? <laughs> what are the possible ways of handling deadlock or avoiding deadlock? Yes? Uh, no hold and wait. So you don't grab a resource and just wait for it. OK. Uh, sorry, and wait for another resource uh, because if you're not getting that resource, if there's two, if there's two uh, threads that are, or whatever process yeah. that are waiting on two resources and trying to grab the other one, they're going to wait indefinitely for the other resource. That's right. One circular dependence is the second one. So you avoid circular dependencies, basically. That's one concrete way, right? You design your routing algorithm such that the circular dependency never happens. And how does it never happen? With XY routing, that circular dependency doesn't happen, right? You could try to construct it, but you can never have that. There are other ways of handling deadlock, actually. You could have escape channels, right? You could always keep some resources. So that you don't have this. Whenever you're about to get that circular dependency, you escape to some other channel. You have separate virtual channels. Or you could be more aggressive. You could allow deadlock and detect and break it. That tends to be harder. But that's an interesting research direction as well, because if deadlock is not the common condition, why not somehow detect and break it? instead of designing your algorithm to be not necessarily maximum performance because you worry about deadlock. How do you handle live lock? <laughs> yes? Um, guarantee of forward progress for at least one of the mm -hmm. packets. That's right. Basically, you need to guarantee forward progress for at least one of the packets. And you also need to guarantee any packet in the system becomes that packet. Right? Because you want to guarantee lilac for every packet in the system, not only one packet. Yeah, at least one packet currently in the system. I guess that works. Yes, what is zero load latency? It's another term that you would hear. Latency when there are no other packets in the, when the network is not there. That's right. When there's no other packets in the network. What is saturation throughput? Throughput when the network is saturated. <laughs> well, what does that mean? <laughs> yes, well, what does it mean for the network to be saturated? It's yes. like the maximum number of packets you can be moving at any one time. Uh -huh. It's not exactly that, actually. This is more of an empirical 
thing, saturation throughput. It's related to this uh, load latency curve. And you guys have seen it, right? And it doesn't necessarily happen when all of the packets are uh, in the network. It happens before that. Uh, basically, this is uh, uh, the load or injection rate. It could be injection rate into the network or it could be the utilization of the network. Let's, let's call it the utilization. Meaning, I guess, what fraction of the network is occupied? What fraction of the buffers and links are occupied? And usually, this could be zero. That's the latency, zero load latency. And this depends on your traffic pattern, of course. We're going to assume a traffic pattern. And one traffic pattern is assuming each node uniformly and randomly communicates with some other node. Right? And usually, this curve looks like this. Right? This is your zero load latency when nothing in the network is utilized. This is the latency that you would get. And as you keep increasing this uniform random injection rate into the network, you get more utilization. And utilization, let's say, is 100% here. Everything is utilized in the network. And your saturation throughput is essentially this part. This is the fraction of network that's utilized, network utilization, that leads to this asymptotic shoot up in latency. And your latency shoots up because your network becomes so congested that uh, you cannot make progress in any of the nodes. And this saturation throughput is usually much less than 100%. That's how the networks operate. Does that make sense? Why is it much less than 100%? Because you can get hotspots in places, right? Think about the roads as a network, right? Not all the roads in Pittsburgh are utilized for you to get significant amounts of congestion that would drive you crazy, right? That's essentially what this is. The network. <laughs> Uh, the latency is so high that the uh, no, nodes are not communicating. But not, all, not, not the entire network is full. And this fullness. So if you have a hotspot communication pattern, this happens potentially at 10%. Hotspot means every node is sending to a single node, single destination in the network. This is, whereas with uniform random, it's around much larger. It could be around 70%, actually. You could do these studies. It's, it's relatively easy to have a network simulator that, to uh, get these low latency curves. Make sense? What about this? I guess you have not covered this. Have you? What's an application of our packet scheduling algorithm? You may have read papers. Yes? Uh, the priority of which packet to, like uh, we discussed that for live block providing, some packet has to be given, mm -hmm. uh, has to be guaranteed a forward progress. So the guarantee is given based on which application is more uh, sensitive to the latency of the network. Yeah, uh, not, not necessarily in live like avoidance, but when you have contention in a router, two packets are contending, the selection, the router selects the packet based on, the which, based on which application that packet belongs to. That's application awareness. And normally, this is, you read the paper, right? That's, that was an assigned review, unless I misremember. No? You guys are not doing the reviews anymore? Uh, basically, what you described is one way of doing it. Prioritize the application that has that is more sensitive to network latency. But it could be any time you make a decision based on the application or the thread, that's, that's an application-aware algorithm. And many packet scheduling algorithms are not aware of applications. Like you could do an oldest first scheduling algorithm. And that's not necessarily good for system throughput, right? Because you, you very well know, because we've covered the memory scheduling algorithms, oldest first is not fair, right? Applications that have lots of packets tend to get prioritized 
Whereas you would like to do the opposite. Applications that have few packets, you would like to prioritize them because that leads to a better system throughput overall, better core utilization. Does that make sense? OK. OK, you should be comfortable with all of these questions, by the way. So this is a, this is a nice summary. <laughs> but it's not a comprehensive summary. Uh, OK, I'll skip some of these. I was going to cover some of these, but you already, these are actually some of the things that are covered. We've just talked about deterministic, oblivious, and adaptive, right? Deterministic always chooses the same path. Oblivious does not consider network state, but doesn't necessarily choose the same path. Adaptive means adapt to the state of the network. How do you adapt? Basically, you can look at local or global feedback based on, let's say, this router looks at which other routers have congestion and then sends the packets to a direction that has the least congestion. And dimension order routing is deterministic. And this is actually employed in many systems. Like Create T3D had the uh, dimension order routing. Uh, well, it was three dimensional, but it was <laughs> still dimension order. You guys covered all of this, right? Yes. Why, why is it good? Because it's simple. And it gives you deadlock freedom. Because there's no cycles in the resource allocation. But downside is it could lead to high contention. And if you have a network uh, that's, mm, that has a lot of path diversity, meaning you could go from the same source to the same destination with many different paths, it's kind of a waste to do this kind of routing. right? For, on the internet, for example, you could go from here to Google with many, many different paths. It makes no sense to always take the same routers right, on the path especially if those routers are congested. Right. Same thing happens here. This leads to a lot of congestion or contention because it may be that many, uh, you may get a lot of traffic in the same dimension. Right. And those traffic may not even be going to the same destination. So you're not exploiting your path diversity really uh, well with the deterministic routing algorithm. OK, so deadlock. Uh, Basically, no forward progress. It's caused by circular dependencies on resources. And this is a good figure that shows that. Let me see. I guess this packet 1 is waiting for this resource, which is held by packet 2, which is waiting for this resource, which is held by packet 3, which is waiting for this resource, which is held by packet 4, which is waiting for this resource, which is held by packet 1. Right. And this happens because you have a circular dependency. Right? And this happens because, like, this doesn't happen with the XY routing algorithm. Because if you use the XY routing algorithm, this packet 4 should not be going this way, right? It's doing YX if you do it this way. If you had done XY, then this circular dependency wouldn't have happened. OK, that's one example. Each packet waits for a buffer occupied by another packet downstream. How do you handle deadlock? This is the answer to that harder question. You avoid cycles in routing, basically. Uh, you can, one way is dimension order routing, but this is not the only way. You could have more sophisticated algorithms, adaptive routing algorithms, that restrict the turns each packet can take. And I'll let you think about that. Uh, that's one way of doing that. And uh, this paper, which you probably did not cover, talks about this. Uh, it's actually a, a very interesting paper. It's more theoretical. I'd encourage you to read it. It's by Glass and Knee. The turn model for adaptive routing, ISCA 1992. The idea is to analyze the directions in which packets can turn in the network and determine the cycles that such turns can form and prohibit just enough turns to break the possible cycles and design an adaptive routing algorithm that obeys all of those rules such that you never get a circular dependency. XY routing is not adaptive. It's deterministic. Right? It's easy to avoid deadlock that way. But how do you avoid deadlock with an adaptive routing algorithm? By restricting just enough turns. You adaptively route, but if you don't have 
uh, if, if your turn model is such that the turning or the packets in the network are limited, is limited, then you can uh, avoid that. And this paper describes that. I will not go into more detail, but it's a very good paper to read. Another way of avoiding deadlock is by having more virtual channels than you need, right? The deadlock happens because you don't have enough resources, right? Whereas if you had another escape channel here, you could have escaped, right? You could break that circularity. And I think detecting and breaking deadlock is another option. Like you could detect the situation potentially, which may be hard <laughs> because who detects the situation, right? It's a distributed decision problem. And once you detect it, you can say, oh, I'm going to drop this packet. That's causing deadlock and allow other packets to go. That, but that could be a viable solution if deadlock is not the common case, right? Assuming the detection algorithm is simple. And I think as, an, uh, as we build more scalable systems, this may be a very interesting option. Not many people are examining this, but I think this is an important direction to examine. Okay. Now you hopefully know valence algorithm. I already described it. <laughs> and this slide should, not, should be familiar now. <laughs> Basically, the goal is balancing network load. And this is a very clever algorithm, I think. It's simple, like a lot of the clever algorithms. Uh, idea is to randomly choose an intermediate destination to go to. And it could be a quadrant of the network. And route the packet to that, to that destination first. And then from that destination, route it to from that intermediate destination routed to the actual destination. Now this is good because, uh, and, and between the source and intermediate, and intermediate to destination, you can actually use dimension order routing. Right? Because you, you're distributing the load across the network. Or you could use some other routing algorithm also. It randomizes or balances network load. Uh, it's not minimal, obviously. Uh, and, uh, the downside, uh, another downside is if your network is not congested, maybe that's not what you want to do, right? It may not be a good idea to <laughs> increase your latency if you have no congestion. So that's the downside is not adaptive. But it's simple. It's very simple to pick a random quadrant to route to, or random node to route to. Adaptive algorithms tend to be not so simple because you need to examine some network condition and you need to avoid deadlock on top of that. Here, if you do this, you avoid deadlock, right? If you do X, Y routing between the source and intermediate destination, intermediate to destination, you avoid deadlock for free. Well, you could optimize this. You could do this on high load, and you could restrict the intermediate node to be close, maybe in the same quadrant. But then, as you do this, uh, the balancing effects go down also, right? Because you're not distributing your load at, at, in the entire network. Your load is locally balanced, but maybe not globally balanced. Adaptive routing. Uh, so you could have minimal adaptive also, right? These are orthogonal dimensions. You could have an adaptive routing algorithm that's minimal. Basically, the router uses network state to pick which productive output port, because you have multiple choices that can be productive, that you could go through the x direction and the y direction. And both of them can be minimal. A productive output port is the port that gets the packet closer to its destination. Uh, well, I guess I'll. It's, it's aware of local congestion if you do that. But minimality restric restricts achievable link utilization. Now your load is not balanced, right? Because you have to be minimal. Whereas you can have non-minimal or fully adaptive algorithms. And these are usually algorithms that actually misroute packets somehow. They take the packets to directions that they don't really want to go to, farther away from the destination. Oblivious algorithms can be minimal or non-minimal also. That's another orthogonal direction, right? I guess you can think of that. OK. Well, with non -minimal, uh, as with no any non-minimal algorithm, you need to guarantee lilac freedom. OK. Adaptive routing is useful for routing around faults also. Uh, if you have a deterministic routing, it cannot handle faulty components, right? That's kind of obvious. 
if you have a faulty router in the middle. Well, too bad. <laughs> you cannot route around it. So one of the other benefits of adaptive routing is actually you can adapt to fault conditions that occur uh, dynamically. But somehow you need to communicate this information. Somehow you need to change the routing table to disable faulty uh, routes, assuming you can detect this. Hopefully you can detect this. OK. You covered some of the real network on chip designs, or no? Real meaning at least, uh, well, I guess the uh, Tile 64 and Tile 100 from Tilera have their real two-dimensional mesh on chip network designs uh, that are actually mesh designs, where other, other, uh, many other commercial uh, implementations today are ring-based designs. It's still an on-chip interconnect or network, but it's not a sophisticated one. It's really a ring. Well, I think you covered all of this, so I will uh, not go through it. But there, there are differences between on-chip and off-chip. On-chip, wires are aban abundant, right? Off-chip, wires are costly. Uh, in fact, uh, if you're building a large supercomputer, you would like all of the nodes to be on-chip. <laughs> because one of the biggest issues I, uh, in building supercomputers is actually the routing complexity that you have between different nodes. I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of these top 500 supercomputers. Have you? Have you? you? You see all of the cables going around? That's a mess, especially when you have faults. Now you need to figure out which cable needs to be unplugged and which cable needs to be plugged. So the operational complexity increases significantly because you, have, you need to connect the components in the right way. And there are stories about these computers not necessarily working in the first time because they did the wiring wrong. And some human that needs to do that wiring, right? It just, it just doesn't happen naturally. <laughs> so, and that, those wires are expensive in many different ways. They're costly, uh, they're power inefficient, uh, they also need to be maintained. Perhaps that's the biggest cost. Whereas on chip wires are free. Well, free. <laughs> Nothing is ever free, but they're free compared to off chip. Uh, it's, you have low latency on chip and you have higher reliability. You have more failures with uh, bigger links. Again, that's fundamental, right? But on chip, there are disadvantages also because now you're sharing the resources, area and power, and you have limited buffering. Buffers are more costly because you cannot do this in software necessarily. And you have... Uh, mm, your topologies can be restricted because you have a two-dimensional plane. Although you could have three-dimensional stacks, right? So if you look at Tyler's networks, I don't have the reference here, but uh, there's a IEEE micro paper on chip interconnection network architecture of the Tile processor. This is from that uh, paper. But what they have is five networks. Four of them are packet switched, and they use dimension order routing and wormhole flow control, and they uh, distinguish between different request types. I guess TDN. It carries the cache request packets. Another network carries the response packets. That's how they avoid the protocol deadlock. Requests and responses cannot interfere with each other because they use separate networks. IO packets go through another network, and core-to-core -core messaging interrupts go through another network. And one network is circuit switched. It's basically low latency, high bandwidth, and this is used for streaming data between uh, memory and a core, and cores and cores. OK, I think I'll stop here. Uh, but any questions before we part? OK, I guess I'll see you on Friday with the milestone presentations. This time you'll present, and I'll ask questions.